Lindsay. I don't even know if I've said, we've been talking here for a few minutes. I've never, I haven't said welcome to the Sharpen podcast. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kirby. We're so pleased to have you join us. Uh, it's my first time getting to meet you. So it's always great when you get to see folks, um, not in person, but the next best closest thing, right? Uh, in our virtual world. And for, for those of us that are meeting you for the first time, tell us a little bit about who you are. Sure. Uh, well, very simply, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a professor, I'm a horsewoman and a pie baker. Uh, I live in Seward, oh, Nebraska. Yeah. yeah, I live in Seward, Nebraska uh, with my husband, Matt, and we have two girls, Lily and Anna. Uh, I raise quarter horses as a side gig uh, alongside my parents. So we have two horses, one dog, one barn cat. I'd say a partridge in a pear tree, but it's more like a, a flock of barn swallows that need to find somewhere else to make their nest. Yes. <laughs> so oh, I love it. A little bit about me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you had me at pa, Lindsay. Uh, <laughs> that, that is for sure. Um, and, and so cool too, to, to have, um, uh, the, the, the horse component as well, a, a native of Kentucky, mm -hmm. um, that, that, that's our love. That's our heartbeat. Even those of us that don't race horses. So, uh, we are so excited to have you on today for, to kick off our mentoring series. So in light of that, tell us about the work that you do. Sure. I'm on the leadership faculty at the university of Nebraska and specifically I'm the director of a leadership mentoring program called NHRI leadership mentoring. What we do is we identify and select outstanding college student leaders at the university and then we pair them in one-to-one -one relationships with outstanding K-12 student leaders. Um, so in essence, we do strengths-based leadership mentoring. That, that has to be completely rewarding work. I can imagine that it's, you know, we always talk about your why for what you do. I can imagine for you, it's really easy to be excited to go to work in the mornings. Uh, we actually were introduced through a former student in the program, which is obviously really meaningful that it's like, hey, this is, this is a great conversation in terms of mentoring. So can you tell us a little bit about, um, I know we're going to talk about mentoring as a young professional, but as you reflect on the work that you've done, um, especially with, um, it's, it's in HRI, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that the correct acronym? Yep. Uh, any, any key learnings, any, uh, any fascinating stories that really, I guess, exemplify the work that you've been a part of? Absolutely. Some of our more recent research looked at uh, the outcomes of these mentoring relationships and what we've learned through our empirical research is that college student leaders who mentor tend to be more generative than their peers. Now, generativity sounds like a made up word. Uh, it refers to the care and concern one has for establishing and guiding the next generation. So what we know is that college student leaders who mentor tend to have significantly higher care and concern for establishing and guiding the next generation. Now, that's not a shocker. They're mentoring, right? We would expect that. What's more interesting about that finding is that generativity is the strongest predictor of social responsibility. Mm -hmm. So now what we know is that college student leaders who mentor, uh, they tend to be more generative and therefore more likely to spend their time and money building a strong family, strong workplace, and a strong community, which is a big deal, especially knowing that the United States is poised to experience one of the largest transfers of wealth and leadership in its history. Right now, 55% of all management occupations are held by somebody age 45 and older. Uh, so we will transfer over half of all management occupations in the next two decades. So for us, it's critical to understand what develops social responsibility. And so, so for us to be able to document mentoring's association with generativity and therefore social responsibility is a big deal as we prepare young adults to take on likely high leadership roles early in their career. Oh, that's, that's a huge deal. So would your work say then that uh, empathy, EQ, et cetera, is, is that taught? Is that, what does, so what, what would be the, the thought there? Because, so we've got, we've got several college students that are listening. Our audience is young professionals. So this kind of speaks to that component. You know, we hear about EQ a lot, empathy a lot. So what would your work say? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, it depends on the group of scholars you're looking at. Uh, some argue that uh, emotional intelligence is trait-based. Um, others argue that it's uh, developmental. 
Uh, so it, it depends a little bit on the, the area of research you're looking in. Uh, we looked specifically uh, at a, in a previous study at predictors of youth leadership life skills and trait-based okay. emotional intelligence did emerge as a significant predictor. Additional to that it was cognitive empathy. Uh, mm -hmm. Now there's cognitive and affective empathy. Cognitive empathy is likened to being able to rationally think why, through why someone's feeling the way that they're feeling. Affective empathy is when you feel what they're feeling. Uh, so we, we found cognitive empathy is also being a significant predictor of youth leadership life skills. So unquestionably, uh, things like emotional intelligence and empathy do have a strong association with leadership, certainly. Yeah, wow. Well, I think that the, the key call out there especially for these college students that have, have joined us is find a way to be mentoring at this stage in life. Cause I'm, I'm sure this is a part of even the work that you do. When you hear the word mentoring, you think of someone that's maybe in their fifties seasoned in their career, and then they, you know, find the, the 20 something and that's mentorship. Right. And it, it's, it can be that, but it looks a lot of different other ways. So uh, I would just love for our college students to, to really take that piece. I mean, we've already got a, a call out, but uh, Lindsay, we would love, so as we think about our, our kind of launch of this mentorship series and, and how we're thinking about it, you know, that's the biggest question is what really is mentorship? How does it differ from what I hear as having a, a, a coach whether I'm in the workplace or out of the workplace. Uh, but then also to talk about, we were just talking about the, the general myth of what mentorship looks like. I'm sure you have a lot of myth busters as well when it comes to mentoring. Absolutely. Um, mentoring and coaching take on two very different functions. So I think in some of our early correspondence, I, I was joking, uh, you know, mentoring and coaching, trust me, they're not synonyms, uh, but they often get treated as synonyms, they right? Do. Uh, yeah. we, we often talk about it and, and hear about it as being one and the same, when in fact they serve very different functions, both of which have high utility, but high utility for their specific function. Uh, so yeah. when we're talking about mentoring, and, and I would say this is one of the biggest reasons why, especially forced mentoring relationships or pre-assigned mentoring relationships tend to fall apart, a key component to a mentoring relationship versus coaching is that a personal relationship has to be involved. Mm. That's a key feature with mentoring that is so often overlooked, right? When we come into a new position and we're assigned a mentor, we do the awkward once per month coffee, right? Uh, we maybe talk about a few things, but it's awkward and it fizzles out at the end of the assigned term. Whereas what I find is that when mentoring relationships, take specific time, and I'm talking about months, when they take a, a significant period of time to develop trust and develop a personal relationship, upon that, a successful mentoring relationship sh can be built. Um, so even if you do come into a new position and you're assigned a mentor, and it can feel awkward when you're the mentee, but to suggest and spend time specifically developing that personal relationship, uh, that's a critical and key component to developing a successful mentoring relationship. Now, counter to that, when we're talking about coaching, coaching is much more of a structured one-on-one -on -one relationship that has a okay. specific purpose. So whereas mentoring is a fantastic tool for things like career development, uh, personal development, leadership empowerment, coaching is much more designed for, especially when we're talking coaching for leadership development, it's really designed for leadership behavioral development and it's, it has fantastic utility for things like after you've gone to a professional development workshop and you want to translate that leadership learning to your specific position, that's when coaching has great utility. Coaching is designed to be unidirectional, as in the coachee is the one who derives the benefit, whereas mentoring relationship is designed to be more reciprocal in that both the mentor and mentee gain benefit from the relationship. So I think for young professionals to understand when and where do I want mentoring, versus when and where do I want coaching? And those are two very different things. And often I, I find with young professionals that sometimes when they're, if they're not assigned a mentor, that's not necessarily a part of their, their work to ask for coaching um, in the mm -hmm. wake of 
professional development experiences, oftentimes that's a pretty easy ask and sell um, to older colleagues who could help them translate what they're learning to how they might be effective in their job. Oh, that's so helpful. Uh, I heard the other day, uh, somebody said, when it comes to people, you know, slow is fast and fast is slow. And I think that's really what you were uh, emphasizing with the mentorship piece, whereas maybe with the coaching route, it might look a little bit more accelerated. So from your experiences and observations, no matter what the generational difference was between the mentor and the mentee, you talk about building that relationship. It, so can you give us some best practices there where you've seen that done really well? Was there an approach that the mentor or the mentee took? Uh, any examples or stories like, hey, it seemed to be that they did this and because of that, they really thrived in the later years. Absolutely. Something within NHRI leadership mentoring that we require our mentors to do is to spend several months developing that trust relationship. And the first thing I tell them is find what you both like to do in common and do those things. So if you love steak and shake, if you love, um, you know, if you love a certain type of movie, right, you love the Avenger movies or like, go do those things. And that's perfectly okay. And, and it's all designed to, to build that trust and that relationship. So it may start out with you both enjoy a certain coffee shop. So you spend some time there, but the key is ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. Now for, for some folks that's easy to do, they can carry on a conversation well. So asking open-ended questions in particular, asking open-ended questions is not difficult for them. For others, it takes more facilitation, um, I would say. So I've seen, for example, leadership mentors uh, and mentees uh, do things like they'll put a fishbowl in the middle of the table and then they each tear off little pieces of paper and just write down questions. Some can be silly and some can be serious. Uh, silly questions might range from what's your favorite YouTube video to what's the funniest moment you had in your youth um, to more serious questions about, you know, I'm nervous about my next performance evaluation. What tips do you might you have to offer? Uh, so point being both, both, approaches can be very successful in developing that trust. Uh, but I think it, it's incumbent upon both mentors and mentees to determine, is this something we can do easily uh, with, without needing facilitation? Or can we do things to uh, increase the likelihood of that personal development relation, or that personal development uh, relationship coming together? And so should we do things like create activities that force us in a way to ask questions that we may have been reticent to ask otherwise? Oh, that, no, that, that's a really great point. I think there's a lot of, you know, you, a lot of articles or suggestions of, and, and I'll come back to what you're saying. There was one the other day that said, um, oh, the gym is the new um, mentor starter, basically startup. And the, the point of it was that folks are doing things like working out or going to a beloved coffee shop together. And the point of it was not necessarily the gym itself, right? You might have two people that absolutely hate the gym, but it's that they find that common activity and there's more relational depth there formed, you know, and sometimes those questions, I don't know about you, but sometimes it's like when you're in the midst of doing something you really love, like for your, I can imagine if someone was out on your horse farm and you're doing something you love, those questions just flow a little bit more naturally. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, yeah. I, I tell students all the time, uh, busy hands tend to lead to open mouths. Uh, so finding something active uh, to do yeah. together, and it could be if you both like to craft, you both like to make pie, you like to do those things together. Sometimes when you're busy doing something, it then becomes easier to let the conversation flow more freely. It feels much less forced. That's good. So when we think about folks that are in the first 10 years. So they've graduated college and uh, they are in that first few years of a, of a career. And they're really thinking about the need and the desire to have a mentor. Uh, it can be intimidating. Uh, you know, so we're here, we're, we're affirming that you should find common activities and focus on building the relationship and how there may also be a need for coaching in your career, but that we're talking specifically mentor uh, when you think about college students that you've seen and they go into the workforce and they really thrive as far as having a mentor in their workplace, a mentor out of the workplace, uh, can you kind of speak to, and even in your own personal experiences, uh, are there any themes of, of things that they've done well? Because the, in, uh, and I 
I think I've shared this with you. The feedback we get from our listeners is it can be super intimidating, especially in the workplace to seek out those kinds of relationships and to even initiate um, beyond almost what you're speaking to with coaching as in, I am now overseeing this project of the company. I know you've done something like this before. Can I get some insight from you? And that is an important place to start uh, the conversation. But can you kind of share with us where you've seen young professionals do this really well in getting in and out of workplace mentors? Sure, absolutely. In fact, I, I think, Kirby, you articulated it beautifully when you said, uh, how do we make sure we don't have this expectation of a one unicorn mentor, right? That can do everything that can develop us professionally as well as personally, that it's okay to have multiple mentors. And Mm -hmm. it's okay to know that not every person is a good mentor. That's okay too. And when you're new to an organization, it's tough to know who's going to be a good mentor and, and who won't. And it's okay to start developing that personal relationship with several fellow colleagues and then to find out over time which ones seem to emerge as effective mentors for you. So it's okay to, for example, it's okay to spend time in meetings, getting to know several different colleagues personally and following up on that, right? So if I know my colleague has uh, two little kids and I might be asking him about, oh, what happened this weekend? Or tell me about the soccer game or, oh, I hear your grandkids visited this weekend. Tell me all about that. So it's perfectly fine to lay the ground to develop that personal relationship with lots of different colleagues. So then when you, when you do come to them with questions, you you're testing a little bit that relationship on whether or not you see it's, it's a good mentoring relationship. And then, then you can start to see, okay, who, who did provide me with answers that were helpful? Uh, Who seems to take an interest in my uh, development as a professional? Uh, Frankly, I think those organic mentoring relationships oftentimes end up being more successful in the long run. Sometimes assigned mentors end up fantastic from the start. Uh, Sometimes they don't. And it's okay to have an assigned mentor and still develop that personal relationship with others because you may find that your assigned mentor was helpful in certain aspects of your job. And in other ways, an organic mentorship that came together uh, through other means ends up being very effective for, for other reasons. So, so I think finding time and effort in every meeting, every interaction to develop that personal relationship with lots of colleagues, again, with the idea of knowing that some of them will be good mentors and some of them won't, uh, that that's okay. And that's a really critical function of what they do, especially as an early career professional. Now related to personal mentoring. Yeah. Um, this, this is where I think young professionals, need to determine like where do they want to develop themselves personally and in what in what areas and who has been a good role model to them in that space right so is it a matter of um they they want to get really involved in their community maybe they're new to a community and they they want to get involved that's important to them well they may know somebody from their hometown who was well connected and stepped into a lot of community leadership roles. Well, it may look like a virtual mentoring relationship for a while, right? Connect over Skype or FaceTime or a few phone calls. So it may not be an in-person mentoring, but if the, if the young professional knows, okay, I really want to get involved civically, or I want to get involved in my community, that that gaining personal mentorship in community leadership may need to involve mentorship from people who don't live there. Um, so I think it's important for a young career professional to identify ahead of time in which areas do I want to grow personally and then how might I go about starting with my own network of people, uh, who do I know, who role models, where I want to grow professionally and then build your network from there. Or, and that mentoring relationship may last for a few years and then you may find that you're then mentored by somebody in a community organization in which you become involved. No, that that's a that's a really great point. I've had a question before where uh, somebody who's just graduating from college will say, so you do think through those folks between in the workplace and out of the workplace. And some folks will say, well, you you almost it's almost like you're like dating, right? Like you're getting to know them, but I don't know if they're interested, but they kind of would be a great coach in this area. Um, And others will say, uh, you know, should you just come in and say, hey, I really respect you. I would like for you to to mentor me. So it's more of a direct versus a, um, you know, kind of getting to know, take it. Do you do you think one of those approaches is more effective than the other? Or does it really just depend on the person? Because that's a reoccurring question that folks have asked me and I'd love to hear your thoughts. 
thoughts? That's a great question, Kirby. Um, I would hold off on asking directly, like, will you be my mentor until you have a fairly significant personal relationship established. I would, I would wait until you, you feel you have that before you go, go directly into, will you mentor me? Uh, for, for a lot of people, being asked, being asked to be a mentor is intimidating uh, because there is, there is a myth that mentors know everything and have all the answers and all the questions and will never steer the mentee wrong. So I think for a lot of people, being a mentor is intimidating. But when it just looks like we've spent time developing a personal relationship or we've gone out to lunch several times and, and by virtue of those lunches, we've talked about some questions um, that you've had personally. Well, you're doing some mentoring, but it's not called mentoring. Does that make sense? Or, or nobody's been, nobody has labeled the relationship so far as being a mentoring relationship. So now, does that mean someone shouldn't pursue those avenues? No, there's no one right way uh, necessarily to, to start a mentoring relationship. But, uh, but I think when it's, when it's labeled too early um, and before that personal relationship is established, it can turn awkward and forced uh, quickly, unintentionally. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really that that that's been a similar thought as well, um, and, and it also just allows, like you said earlier, that time to just to get to know someone because at a glance it may seem like that person would be a perfect uh, mentor, but then over time it's like I just don't know if that's their interest. So, uh, you know, one thing that uh, I would love to hear you speak to, but also to encourage our audience. So when we think of myth busters around mentorship, we've talked through several of those today. Uh, but one in particular um, that I feel really strongly about is this this generational piece, right? Like you need to be in this generation to mentor. And what I love about the work that you guys do is that you immediately tell college students, you're a leader, you're a mentor, you have something to offer. You don't have to know everything in order to be an impactful mentor. So for an audience of young professionals, typically the conversation around mentoring is framed up around being a mentee not being a mentor. Can you speak to that other side of mentorship for this audience and, and what you would encourage us with today? Absolutely. In fact, what I love about college students and young professionals is that they get to engage in what I would call sandwich mentoring uh, and that they're in a beautiful <laughs> position to be both mentored and, as well as serve as, uh, That's a good point. serve as the mentor. So what I would say is that both should be happening and it can look like many different forms, peer mentoring uh, is absolutely an effective form of mentoring. In fact, uh, what we know from uh, some of my colleagues' research in the multi-institute study of leadership is that uh, some of the uh, uh, values associated with the social change model, I won't get into all that, but what, what we learned from, from their comprehensive research is that some values associated with the social change model are impacted by faculty mentoring, as in someone older than you mentoring you. But we know peer mentoring fills in the gaps, uh, that peer mentoring actually impacts different values associated with the social change model than faculty mentoring. So it, it, is, it is very wise for the young professional to not only seek mentors, but to also serve as a mentor. And what we're learning, right, is that when college student leaders in particular, but I'm, I would guess that this extends to young professionals that when they mentor, things like generativity develops in them. Uh, so the, the great news is that when they serve as a mentor or when they serve as a mentee, different things are being developed. Uh, and that actually they're, uh, by virtue of young professionals seeking that sandwich mentorship, uh, they're developing themselves in a more holistic way anyway. Well, the individual who connected us, Kyle Peary, um, is a prime example of, I always look to him as a, as a mentor. He was one of my first bosses I ever had. I think I've shared that in episode before, uh, but that certainly is peer mentoring. I mean, I always feel like I learned something new. And there's also this piece too, uh, where your, your guards may be down a little bit more because you're maybe a little bit more honest about where you fall short in competencies. You're maybe a little bit more honest about aspirations and competencies because that person is a peer. Um, and, and I think about um, the first couple of years of your career, you tend to do a really good job in this space, but then as you get more and more comfortable, uh, 
you start to think, well, I know that, right? Like I don't need to spend as much time with these folks. And I think that's where we sometimes very often miss the mark young professionals, seasoned professionals, and the list goes on Mm -hmm. because it's such a valuable form of, of mentorship. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I I love, I love the sandwich mentoring piece. I'd never heard it. I think that that's kind of the, the sweet spot for young professionals. So, um, you know, the, uh, the, the group that, that listens to this podcast will always, um, wants to, to leave the day. Okay. Like here's my call outs. Here's my call to action. And I think we've covered so many of them. College students be mentoring in your sphere of influence, young professionals, be mentoring in your sphere of influence. And also, you know, you walked us through really nicely too of how to um, pursue mentorship relationships in a way that is natural and lets them fall into place. But uh, as you think about this group, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to exit this episode, right. And get on, get into your work week or your work day, um, what would you call to action? Because I think this is one of the greatest pieces in terms of career success, personal thriving, and the list goes on for us to think about. So what else would you call us to action to today? Absolutely. The, what I love about mentorship is that it brings together both the personal relationship as well as the personal development and leadership empowerment. Um, so mentoring not only has the capability to develop you as a career professional, um, develop you as a leader, Uh, but also it creates space for meaningful relationships at work or in your personal life. Uh, Gallup survey uh, many years ago looked at uh, predictors of thriving at work, and one was having a best friend at work. Uh, Not to say that your mentor becomes your best friend, but the idea behind mentoring that brings together both that personal relationship as well as that career development leadership empowerment is that it does allow you space and the opportunity to create meaningful relationships at work, which then allow you to thrive, uh, both both in the workplace and outside of the workplace. I think when we uh, find ourselves in a workplace situation that um, that does not develop us, we we find that we resent going to work, we resent the job. Uh, whereas when we have those meaningful relationships at work, even when the work is hard, we're able to be resilient. Uh, right? So mentoring relationships not only do something to develop us, but to also create a thriving space um, at work, which then I think extends to how we feel about ourselves personally. Yeah. And you think about all of the data around the loneliness epidemic that we are in the midst of as we get more and more disconnected in terms of relationships. I think that just really plugging in, hey, I'm going to be a mentor and then I'm going to be mentored is a great place to start. I think young professionals often fall in this category Mm -hmm. of that loneliness epidemic because odds are you've moved, you've been, your roots have somewhat been lifted up and you've had to migrate in some fashion. And, And this is is just such a great way uh, to get started. Um, so we are so, I, I think we are so much better for, uh, for your time today and, and just leaving us with not only some, some data sets to think about, but some call outs. Um, for those that would like to learn more about the work that you all are doing, especially our college students that listen, can you mention some ways that we can find you? Sure, absolutely. If you want to learn more about NHRI leadership mentoring, our website is nhri.org or you can find this on the University of Nebraska's website. Um, Additionally, feel free to get in touch with Kirby, and Kirby, please feel free to share my contact information. Uh, You're not bothering me if you want to reach out to me personally and ask some questions. Every mentoring relationship looks unique. Uh, No one mentoring relationship should look like the other. Um, So if I can answer any personal questions about a specific relationship or how you might go about navigating a new mentoring relationship, I'm happy to help. Awesome. And we'll include links in show notes as well so that folks can find you guys in the awesome work that you're doing. Uh, well, we, uh, we always ask two questions of every guest that comes on the Sharpen podcast. The first is we love to have a shout out. So a group of people or someone that you want to affirm and give recognition to. And we'd love to, to hear that from you today. Sure, absolutely. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't offer a shout out to the students who inspired this podcast, the students who are involved in NHRI leadership mentoring. Uh, They bring color to our black and white understanding of mentoring, um, and they inspire me to mentor better every day. Well, I I can imagine that you have so many students that you're proud of. It's probably super cool. How many years have you been involved with the program again? 
I've been the director for 11 years. NHRA wow. Leadership Mentoring is actually 70 years old. It was started wow. by positive psychology pioneers, Dr. William Hall and Dr. Donald Clifton back in 1949. So I'm excited just to be part of the, the history of this program. There's so many generations that are out there making a huge impact. And I can imagine that maybe for some of them, this concept first started through this program in college. So that's, that's remarkable. Um, you guys are doing some really, really neat work there. Um, we would love to hear from you too today. What's been a, what's been a game changer? So it can be a conversation, an article. Uh, I always say a food item and everybody that listens to the podcast regularly is like, would you just stop asking for people to give a food item? But I'm going to leave it out there. But anything that's been a game changer for you? Oh, absolutely. Uh, speaking to the, the horsewoman aspect of my identity, a game changer for me was when my dad called me. Oh gosh, this would have been five years ago now, he called me, they were living in Oklahoma at the time. And he said, Lindsay, he said, I've got too many horses and not enough pasture. He said, uh, will you help me? Will you take some? And I said, yeah, sure. And uh, so now we've got a couple horses. And I, and I always say that uh, working with horses teaches you a lot about how to be a good mom. And that especially working with young horses, I, I've learned that uh, my key objective is to help them navigate scary things while keeping their head. And I find that working with little kids, it's the same way. I just try and keep my kids from blowing their can when things are hard, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, so that's really been a yes. game changer for me is uh, recon reconnecting uh, back to horses has really been a, a game changer for me to think about how I work with students, how I work with kids. Well, I know you'll get a laugh out of this. My dad raises cattle and he always says that he would rather put a load of steers onto the cattle trailer than put our children in their car seat. So <laughs> there are many learnings. He says one's easier than the other. Uh, but in all truth, all of it is super character building. I think uh, the fun part of this podcast has been bringing on folks that work in and out of agriculture. And I think so many of us that have roots in um, maybe today or during our childhood of agriculture, we find so many of those character building, patience building uh, moments and, and that can look differently whether you're out of agriculture but I don't know about you it always makes me super thankful to have to to work especially livestock right they keep you humble that's right if you've got a scoop poop you know what humility looks like yeah that's right that's you know where you stand in life that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much for your time today it's just been a joy to get to talk with you thanks Kirby I appreciate it